Okay. So in the last chunk, we talked about what are experiments and why they're helpful and some different ways of thinking about experiments. Now I want to talk a little bit about some ways that social scientists have thought about experiments that help us learn as much as we can from experiments. So I see a lot of experiments that I see, uh, I feel like are kind of missed opportunities. Because people are like, oh, I'm going to do it. Like uh, in a lot of these online systems, they're like, oh, I'm going to do an A-B test. And I say, A-B test, that is great. That's going to help you learn something. But if you use ideas from social science about how to design and interpret the results from experiments, you can learn much more than you would learn from a simple A-B test. So I'm going to try to review some of the ideas that social scientists have developed over time to design interesting experiments and talk a little bit about how these make more or less sense in the digital age. Um, so I want to make this distinction between what I see happening a lot on digital platforms at tech companies, which I would call optimizing experiments, and what I think social scientists normally do, which are called understanding experiments. So social scientists often want to understand the mechanism that is leading to a certain behavior, and people at a tech company often want to, let's say, increase click-throughs. And so these seem like very different things, but what I want to argue is that if your goal is to actually do optimization, the best way to do optimization is to understand what is happening. So there are, you can for, do, for example, as Google famously did, trying 41 different shades of blue to see which is the optimal link color. Uh, and that is a totally fine optimizing thing to do. Um, but for more complex behaviors, I think increasingly people will decide that optimization requires understanding and that, optimiz and that understanding enables you to break out of sort of local uh, minima so that, or maxima. So like what these optimization, like let's say you have this big mountain and like you want to get to the top of the mountain and a lot of these kind of A-B tests and optimizing experiments sort of move you around kind of where you are right now. And you can do a little tweak, and things can go up, and that's great. But it's not really going to get you to the sort of next highest peak in the mountain through this process of trial and error. The way that you're going to get these big improvements, I think, is going to come from understanding what's happening. And increasingly, we want to be able to combine these things. We want to, particularly if you want to partner with an organization, or you want to partner with a company, you're going to want to be able to design experiments that achieve both of these goals simultaneously. Because your partner is often going to be very interested in moving a particular metric. You are going to often be motivated by trying to understand something. And I think we want to have more and more ways that we can design experiments that achieve both of these goals, particularly if you want to do them with some partner. Um, so I think a great example of this is this paper. It's a, um, field experiment, um, analog field experiment, uh, about the power of social norms. And so what they did is they measured people's electricity consumption, uh, and then they gave them some information about their consumption relative to their neighbors. So this was not exactly what they gave them, but something like this. And they said, you are using less energy than your efficient neighbors, and you're using less energy than all of your neighbors. And then they tried to measure whether this would change the amount of electricity people use. They were very interested in decreasing the amount of electricity people would use. And what they found is no effect after one week or after three weeks. So this seems like not a very interesting experiment, except they were actually much more clever uh, than what I've just described to you. So they thought carefully about what they were doing, and they reasoned that there might be differences based on the amount of electricity people were using ahead of time. And so if you split this out uh, by the people who were using, um, people who were using m less energy after they got this uh, flyer, started to use more energy. So they were like, oh, I'm not using enough energy. I should be using more. <laughs> so you see this, it had this 
but for people who are using more, it caused them to use less. Okay, so basically, for some people, this treatment had the intended effect. For other people, this treatment had exactly the opposite effect. And this was true whether you're measuring one week after the treatment or three weeks after the treatment. And in fact, they had anticipated this as well, and they had designed another treatment which was intended to mitigate this problem, to mitigate this boomerang effect. And so what they did is for some people, in addition to giving them this information, which they called uh, descriptive norm, they also gave them this information, which is a proscriptive norm. So they said, if you are actually doing less, we want to let you know this is good. You should be happy about this. And so the, the reason that they did this, they argue in the paper, is that this comes from a theory of norms. And so they have this paper from like 1990 about the importance of the difference between descriptive norms and proscriptive norms. And so the treatment here is absolutely derived from a much more abstract idea about what's going to happen. And so notice that they didn't change this color to blue or change this to red and like try different shades of colors. They like thought about how people are going to be making decisions based on this more abstract theory, which allowed them to design this treatment. And this treatment here ended up dramatically reducing this boomerang effect. So you took, so this sort of walks us through an entire trajectory. You have something that doesn't look like it's doing anything, but in fact, it's actually doing two offsetting things, which is a very uh, important thing that can be lost when we look at the average treatment effect. Uh, and then we have a new treatment that was motivated by theory that helps eliminate the sort of part of the effect that you don't want. Um, and so we take a program that seems like it's not doing anything and actually turns it into something that's working well. Um, so then the other thing I want to say about this that's kind of interesting is that after this, this treatment designed by these researchers got picked up by a company called Opower and uh, deployed at a massive scale. So maybe some of you have gotten things like this on your electricity bill. Um, and here's a case where the, once they partnered with Opower, they moved from an experiment that could be done with like 300 people to an experiment that's been done, I think, with 10 million people. And so how is it that Opower is able to do this on a much bigger scale? So the recruitment of participants, the electric companies already have all of the participants. There's no, the recruitment is free, essentially. Uh, randomization is very easy. Be, when they print up people's bills, they can send them. It's easy to randomize inside of that printing system because that's run by computers. Uh, delivering the treatment, they mail them the letters. Uh, and then the outcome here, though, is measured by these physical sensors in the built environment, your electricity meter. So the variable cost in these experiments is zero, and that's what allows them to get really, really big. So I want to emphasize also these zero variable cost experiments are not just online. So I started with Recevo and Vanderite and Wikipedia, and you're like, okay, yeah, digital stuff online. But increasingly, I think we will see physical sensors in the built environment. So you'll probably all hear about the Internet of Things. And increasingly, we are going to live, I think, in a world of sort of constant measurement of everything we're doing in the physical world as well. And so the important difference is not between online systems and offline systems. It's between analog systems and digital systems. And I want to also point out that this Scaling it up to 10 million people is not just about being cool. Um, it's also about learning different kinds of things. So one of the things that was very interesting that they learned when they scaled it up is they saw that over time, the effect seems to get smaller and smaller. And so there are many possible reasons for that. And what they actually conclude in the paper is that this is actually not the original researchers. This is a different researcher, Hunt Alcott. So what he essentially concludes is that the kinds of uh, power companies that adopted this early had more energy conscious consumers for whom the treatment had a bigger impact. And that as we start rolling this out in more and more places, the customers who are receiving it are becoming different and the treatment is becoming less effective. 
So this is a very um, important insight about heterogeneity between people, which is something that's very hard to understand if you do a single experiment. Um, and scientifically, that heterogeneity is very important. And for practical reasons, that heterogeneity is very important. So if you do something in one place and you're like, oh, this is awesome, this works so well, we're going to scale it up. And then it turns out that the place that you did it happens to be a place where it's most likely to be effective, which, by the way, I think many academic experiments are like, uh, right? Because if you are designing an experiment, like, you are going to want the experiment to work. And working usually means having some difference between the treatment group and the control group. So you're going to pick a site where you think it's going to work, and that's great. And then if people try to scale up from that, then they may um, not get the same effects in other settings. Um, so I want to briefly, so now if we want to try to design um, more interesting experiments, uh, I think there are three ideas from social science that are very helpful for that. And they are validity, heterogeneity of treatment effects, and mechanisms. And so I want to walk through each of these. You've probably heard all of these before. I just want to walk through each one briefly. So validity is kind of like, uh, it's like a, in the way that the total survey error framework was like a way of thinking about all the problems that can happen. I think the people who have worked on validity of experiments uh, try to think about all the possible errors that can happen and fit them into these broad categories. So the first is uh, statistical uh, uh, conclusion validity. So this is basically like, did you do your statistics correctly? Um, uh, so that, those issues are generally the same in analog and digital experiments, although certain digital experiments have different statistical challenges. Um, internal validity is roughly the idea of did, your, did you actually do what you think you did in your experiment? Was there some kind of leakage of information or something didn't actually physically work right? So digital systems are generally very good for that, like generally, if you are doing an experiment on an online platform, it should deliver the treatment to the people it's supposed to deliver the treatment to. It should measure the outcome correctly. Um, this is not always true in field experiments. Um, generally, online experiments should, and digital experiments should help improve internal validity. Uh, construct validity, so this is a different thing, and this is a very, I think, underappreciated problem. So, Social scientists uh, often reason about kind of abstract things like democracy or social capital. And these are ideas that we talk about and think about. And then when we have to actually do something, you have to have some way of measuring or quantifying that construct. So like you might say democracies are less likely to go to war with each other or something like that. So that's kind of a theoretical statement. And then you have to like define what a democracy actually is and measure that construct. And that is often very tricky. And you'd same with war. That would be hard, too. And so often in um, digital experiments, sometimes we get a good measurement of the construct we want. So in the Restivo and Vanderheit, it's contributions to public goods. So edits to Wikipedia, I think, are a good match for that construct. But sometimes if we're doing an experiment in a system we don't control, let's imagine we're doing an experiment in Facebook, or uh, Facebook might not operationalize the kinds of ideas that we care about in their system. And so you can potentially have an experiment that is completely correct, high internal validity, correct statistics, but doesn't actually inform the theoretical thing statement that you're trying to address. And so one way to check for this slippage between the actual experiment and the constructs that people are often making statements about is to just swap out the words. So I like to do this all the time. It's just remove all the fancy words. So take out social capital, take out democracy, take out all that stuff, and just look at exactly what they did and whether that seems interesting and relevant to you. And so if you just read the intro of the paper and you just read the conclusion, you're just reading the fancy words part. So get rid of that and look at what actually happened 
And in a lot of digital settings, it is hard to make the fancy things that we care about match to the things that we can do. And so that is a big source of slippage a lot that we need to be very cautious about. Uh, and the final kind of validity that people talk about a lot is external validity. This is sort of, if we have a lab experiment, let's say we might wonder if we would get different results if we ran it in a different place at a different time with different participants. In the past, external validity has been largely something that people would argue about without evidence, I would say. So I've been in talks where people would say, OK, I did this experiment, and this is what I found. Someone would be like, oh, what about the external validity? And the speaker would be like, well, I think it would be externally valid. I think it would get the same results other places. Someone else would be like, I don't think so. Well, I think so. Well, I don't. I mean, it's like, so this actually really here is an empirical question, right? We can measure to what extent we get similar results other places uh, with different operationalizations. And here, lower cost is wonderful. Lower cost is your friend. Because what it means is that you can actually do that. So someone has a question about the external validity of your experiment. If your experiment is 10 times cheaper than everyone else's experiment, then you can do it 10 times with 10 different pools of people. And so this, I think, we talked about cost and cutting cost not as an end, but a means to an end. And I think one of those especially important means is external validity because it allows you to replicate your experiment in slightly different ways with slightly different groups of people. Um, OK, so that's validity. This is kind of a checklist. And so, uh, oh, yep. Uh, as you're reading other experiments or talking about experiments, these ideas about validity maybe help you sort of categorize your concerns and communicate them clearly to others. Question. I have kind of a question about definition. Yeah. Because when I was, I mean, at some point, I was doing some some work related to kind of theoretical causal validity, mm -hmm. and I understood that I have hard time to understand whether there is like so. This is the list of standard validities because Correct. there's also ecolog ecological validity. I think, yes, and some other validities. So there were yes. like so many of them. So yes. in my paper, I had a hard time. This is, what, this is the first question. And second is, uh, I think you said it, but that was another difficult thing because even there was no even, so there was not even a single, uh, single definition of what is experiment. Yes. So the definition of experiment, and they were like, yeah. So yeah. Do, you, do you think like that there is now some, like it was like five years ago, so maybe it has changed since then. Uh, Since that time. No. I, well, okay, so uh, let me answer so the validity and what it actually means. Um, so, this idea of validity, it's very much drawn from the work of Cook et al., Cook and Campbell. Um, they have a book that has, I think, 20 validities or something. Yeah, so I think um, that book is cited in bit by bit. You can read it. I think. So, this is one of the challenges with this validity framework is that. It's not mathematized, and so it ends up feeling like a collection of things rather than a kind of coherent framework that we know is like uh, exhaustive and mutually exclusive, right? You'd like something that covers the entire space and doesn't overlap, right? That would be like very clean. That is not what this is, but there is a lot of wisdom in these ideas. Um, and so I think that. Um, these are the things, these are the four of that huge list that I think are most relevant to experiments. But it's true that like external validity is not ever, it's something you hear people talk about a lot and you don't ever really see a precise definition for, or I should say there are many different definitions. Um, so I think it's the same thing about what is an experiment. So again, there are many different definitions. This is why at the beginning I tried to distinguish between these um, perturb and observe pasta sauce things, and like a randomized controlled trial like what you would see in a medical setting. Other questions? Yep. Uh -huh. yep. Yes, absolutely. So I wanted, to, that, that's a great point. So internal validity in some ways is about you kind of making sure that everything that you think is happening is happening and nothing that you don't think is happening is happening. Um, and network effects are a big problem. So just to briefly summarize the concern, um, sometimes, so in a, um, 
in a, let's say we we're gonna do a clinical trial of a drug to lower cholesterol. And then um, whether I, some people would get that drug, some people would get the placebo. So whether I get the placebo um, has very little impact on the effect of that drug on Chris. And whether Chris gets the placebo has very little effect on me because basically we're sort of independent. Now that's not totally true in certain settings. For, I'm not a doctor, but okay. But it's pretty, pretty close to true for lots of drugs. Um, in a lot of social settings, people are connected to other people and should one person receive the treatment, that can potentially impact people that they're connected to socially. And so in a lot of experiments that you see on Twitter or Facebook, um, this is a major issue that your treatment can be spilling out into, it's like if I was gonna take this cholesterol drug and it would like, like happen to like radiate from my body and my friends would get some of the, the benefits of this drug. Um, and so it's a big issue and it is a tricky issue. I think Chris has done some work on this in some of his experiments. So definitely something to be aware of if you're doing them in a social media site. That's an example of something that comes up more now than I think in the past because the context in which we're doing these experiments is slightly different. Or maybe it's always existed in the past and we just haven't paid as much attention to it. Other questions? Okay, so remember we're talking about ideas that can help us design more interesting experiments. So one is thinking about validity and you know, as you're designing your experiment, you wanna be thinking about these issues as you're interpreting the experiments of others and communicating about them, you wanna be thinking about these issues as well. Okay, heterogeneity of treatment effects is the second. So we've already seen a little bit of an example of this uh, with the um, power experiments, the electricity experiments. So sometimes a treatment can have a positive effect on someone and sometimes it can have a negative effect. And we often report the average, but the average obscures lots of information. So in the past, we often had to report the average because if you have, let's say, 100 people in your experiment, or in psychology, sometimes 20 people in your experiment, uh, all right, 50, 50. Uh, let's say you have 50 people. It's hard to measure any heterogeneity. But now, if you have 500,000 people, it becomes wasteful to just report the average. Um, it's just not taking advantage of what you have. The other thing that's different now is that we have much more information about these people. So if you think about a Psych 101 style experiment, the people show up to the lab and you often don't know that much about them. Um, now compare that to setting like Facebook, where you're doing an experiment on Facebook, they know tons and tons of stuff about you before you're in the experiment. So these two things are really different. So one is much, much larger samples and two is much, much more pretreatment information and so that means we should stop treating people like widgets. The way that we treat participants is roughly, they're all kind of interchangeable. And we know that that's not true. And so if we have more pretreatment information and we have more people, we can study heterogeneity. And heterogeneity is very important scientifically. If you think about a lot of our theories are about why some things are more or less in different people or different places. It's also super important practically. So if you work at, let's say, Netflix, and you want to give a certain coupon to people, you want to give that coupon to the people that it will make the biggest difference for, and you don't want to give that coupon to anyone for whom it's going to hurt them, right? Or have the opposite of the effect you want. So for practical reasons, heterogeneity is super, super important as well. So I think this is a place, remember I talked about combining, optimizing experiments and understanding experiments? To me, heterogeneity is like a really good place for that because it seems like something that everyone would care about. Um, now, there are bad ways of looking for heterogeneity. So one of the ways is to take your data and split up different groups and look and see if they're different. And if not, then split the data a different way. And then if not, split the data a different way. So don't do that. That's called phishing. Uh, that's a bad idea. Um, there are many newer techniques that try to deal with this problem. So one way to deal with it is to pre-register or sort of have the idea ahead of time. So I'm very interested in heterogeneity by age and race. And so I'm going to pre-register exactly what I'm going to do. 
This is great if you know ahead of time what you want to do. Um, sometimes you don't. And so there are also techniques now that allow you to look for heterogeneity that are sensitive to this overfitting issue. This is another place where um, splitting up your training data and your testing data can be helpful. So in the Fragile Families Challenge, we split the data. And there's one set where you could do whatever you want because we can prevent overfitting by checking it on the holdout data. And so in experiments, there are techniques that have a similar flavor where you can sort of do whatever you want on one part as long as you have this other part that's kept separate and you can use that for testing. Um, yeah, there's a lot of interest in this area now. Yeah? I was just wondering about what kinds of treatment effects, and especially like non-compliance and that kind of thing, because in health science, there's a big discussion about what you should report. Is it the treatment effect among the treated, or yes. what to do about that? Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, so this, I would, I would think of this, so in, in the internal validity, I would put this kind of in internal validity, is how I would think about it, I guess. So like, let's imagine that you, uh, let's go back to this cholesterol study. Um, or let's go, let's pick a social science example. Let's say um, we're interested in what's the effect of watching the news on TV on your political attitudes, let's say. And so you as a researcher might say to someone, okay, we would like you to watch the news for 30 minutes every night. And then we'll give you surveys and we'll track how this, um, impacts your attitudes. And not everyone is going to do what you say. And so this is called non-compliance. And so this creates a number of challenges in the analysis because it's not clear how you should include those people. Should you only report the people that watch the TV, then you're not really, that's not a super fair comparison because you're comparing the people that comply with your request to everyone in the control who includes people who might or might not comply. Uh, should you just include everyone who, re who received the encouragement and the people who didn't receive the encouragement? That's not totally, that seems a little unfair too because then you're not really me measuring the effect of the actual treatment, you're measuring the effect of the encouragement, right? Because you're sort of, so this is a subtle issue. I don't know what the right thing to do is. Uh, I think the right thing to do is sort of be clear about what you're reporting. I guess that would be, uh, and um, be clear about the limitations of that thing. But as you start doing experiments in the world, you run into problems like non-compliance. Um, you can also run into something called two-sided non-compliance, which is even more complicated, where people in the control group sometimes actually get the treatment because like, people in the control group can watch the news anyway. Like, you can't stop them from watching the news. So this makes the analysis of experiments, I think, even more complicated. And you have to be clear about exactly what effect you're estimating and what you're reporting. Other questions? OK. So uh, I want to talk about the final idea that I think can be very helpful is mechanisms. So I think a great example, oh, I took out the picture. So a great example of mechanisms is um, uh, limes and scurvy. So scurvy, you, no one here has had scurvy, I presume, which is great. We're all very lucky. Um, scurvy used to be a really, really big problem. Um, so people would go out on boats and sail around to try to fight wars or to trade, and they would get scurvy, and it was, their teeth would fall out, and it was really bad. Um, and they didn't really know what was causing scurvy. So they tried a bunch of different things, and they found that giving people citrus prevented them from getting scurvy. And so that is a, in that case, they understand that if you eat citrus, then you won't get scurvy. But then the question is, so that's great. So you might say, all right, they're done, great. Uh, but then you might want to know why does eating citrus prevent you from getting scurvy? And so that's really a question about mechanism. So it's not whether the treatment is effective or not. That's often the first step that we have. But then the second step is almost always, well, why did it work? 
And this can be very, very helpful as well because if you, and it took them, I think, another 200 years to figure out that it was vitamin C was the mechanism through which this happened. But if you understand the mechanism is vitamin C, then that opens up a huge range of new treatments. So it turns out it's not easy to have citrus in a boat sailing around. And there are other things that have a lot of vitamin C that are easier to keep in boats. And now you can just take a vitamin C pill. And so if you think about some effect that you've seen in an experiment in the world, uh, and if you understood what the mechanism actually was, then you could imagine like distilling and concentrating that mechanism and like turning it into the vitamin C pill. So it'd be easier and more effective. So like that's the hope of, again, here we have a combination of an optimizing thing and an understanding thing. Understanding the mechanism, I think pretty much every scientist will tell you that's important. But if you want to optimize, understanding the mechanism is also super important. Uh, and so that's kind of the idea with limes and scurvy. Now the problem, uh, for those of you who have tried to understand what mechanisms are in your experiments, is that it's super, super hard. Um, so most things are not as easy as scurvy and limes. And that took 200 years. Um, so uh, Don Green and some colleagues have a paper called Enough Already about black box experiments where they go through and talk in detail about why these things are hard. I would recommend reading that paper. Um, so the reason, the, what, what they mean by black box experiments is, you know, the treat, we see the treatment has some effect, but we don't know why. That's the black box. And so everyone wants to open up the black box, but that's super hard. Now, there are increasingly is research about experiments designed specifically to test mechanisms or to explore mechanisms. So this is, I think, a very exciting area of experimental design. I would highly recommend checking out those papers. Um, and so mechanisms are great, but mechanisms are hard. OK, so we've talked about experiments. And we've talked, uh, you sort of set up this kind of contrast at the beginning between experiments that are focused on optimization, like increasing click-through rates on ads, let's say, and the kinds of experiments that scientists often do that are focused on understanding. And I've tried to make the argument that a lot of times these are actually, these goals can be worked together. So understanding heterogeneity of treatment effects, for example, is very useful for both of these goals. Understanding mechanisms is very useful for both of these goals. And thinking about validity is very important for making sure that you are not fooling yourself about either your understanding or your optimization. So, um, and thinking about this hybrid is really important if you want to partner with organizations to do your experiments, which is a very, very common strategy that people have for doing field experiments. So, any questions? Yeah, Dan? Is this one? Yeah, okay. I was wondering about the, the power company and that, like, isn't there often a conflict of interest? Like, why would they want to have you decrease your spendings? And isn't that the general problem when you partner up with the, with the company? They want to make you consume more and you want something that's not that generally? Okay, that's a great question. Um, so one is the specific thing about the power company. Uh, so I believe it's the case that, uh, um, okay, I don't know the details of the power companies, but my understanding is one, that they're regulated. And so in some cases, there are laws that are encouraging them to um, decrease their sort of quasi required to. Also, I think there's an economic incentive, which is that it's very difficult to build a new power plant and it's very expensive. And so if they can continue to serve everyone just with the amount of plants they have, they want to do that. Um, the second question is, I think, a more general one, which is about if you're partnering with someone, how do you make sure that your incentives are aligned? In other words, does the company, or it could be an NGO, or it could be the government, is your partner trying to do something that you personally want to do? Uh, and that is obviously has to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. But uh, David Lazar, for example, in his talk, talked about thinking about values in terms of the problems we choose to work on. 
And so I think here's a case where you can think very carefully about what partners you want to work with and whether the kinds of things they're doing are things that you think are beneficial and it's an important part of the partnering process. Other questions? OK, now we're going to take a coffee break. For real? OK, we're going to take a real coffee break, and we'll be back at 10.30, 15 minutes.